Welcome, dear listeners, to the Diplomacy and Discourse podcast, your gateway to understanding the intricate world of international relations and global affairs. I'm so thrilled to embark on this journey with you as we delve now into the complexities of one of the most pressing conflicts of our time. In this special series, we'll be exploring the devastating war between Israel and Hamas, a conflict that shook the foundations of the Middle East and reverberated across the globe. This episode marks the beginning of a two, maybe three part exploration where we will rewind the clock to the events leading up to October the 7th, 2023. We'll dissect the political landscape in Israel from the seismic protests against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to the fateful day when Hamas launched a devastating attack, altering the course of history. Join me as we uncover the untold stories, unravel the intricate geopolitics, and seek to understand the human toll of this conflict. Welcome to the Diplomacy and Discourse podcast. Welcome listeners to the intricate dance of politics unfolding in Israel before the storm of October 2023. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu found himself back in the limelight following his corruption scandal poised to reintroduce his contentious judicial reform plan. This proposal aims to recalibrate the balance of power, curtailing the authority of the Israeli Supreme Court to a consultative role. Despite encountering obstacles, Netanyahu remained resolute in advancing his agenda, aware of the mounting pressure from his far-right coalition partners. In navigating this political minefield, Netanyahu employed a delicate balancing act, addressing the divergent demands of his coalition constituents. While he has already relieved the ultra-Orthodox contingent with substantial government subsidies, the onus was mollifying the far-right and religious factions within his cabinet. Failure to appease these stakeholders could precipitate calls for the annexation of the West Bank escalating tensions on both domestic and international fronts. Meanwhile, this pre-existing backdrop of strained relations between Israel and the Palestinians added another layer of complexity to the political landscape. While neither party seeks an outright confrontation, the specter of conflict looms large, particularly in the face of a right-wing agenda perceived as antagonistic to the Palestinian aspirations. As the United States grapples with competing foreign policy priorities, the path to any form of diplomatic resolution remained fraught with uncertainty. Discord simmered within Netanyahu's coalition government as competing interests vied for influence. The delicate interplay between ultra-Orthodox factions and ultra-nationalistic elements underscores the fragility of the political equilibrium. Netanyahu's leadership was tested as he navigated the choppy waters of coalition politics, mindful of the delicate balance required to sustain his government. Amidst this political turbulence, President Isaac Herzog's proposal for compromise injected a new dynamic into the equation. However, the road to consensus is fraught with challenges as Netanyahu walked a tightrope between appeasing his coalition partners and preserving political stability. As legislative debates unfolded within the Knesset, the fate of the occupied territories hung in the balance. Proposals ranging from equal treatment of settlers to restrictions on Palestinian activities underscored the contentious nature of the issue. Finance Minister Shal Smotrich's efforts to bolster infrastructure further emphasized the government's commitment to asserting control over contested territories. Yet amidst the din of political maneuvering, the specter of settler violence loomed considerably and exacerbated tensions, which further complicated prospects for peace. Netanyahu's ability to navigate these treacherous waters was crucial in determining the trajectory of this conflict. So, as Israel grappled with the internal strife and external pressures, the path to resolution remained elusive. With tensions simmering and alliances shifting, the future of the region hung in the balance, with far-reaching implications for peace and stability. Now, let's dive deep into the aftermath of the Israel attack, setting the stage for a turbulent journey through the Middle East's geopolitical landscape. Brace yourselves for a roller coaster ride as we explore the ripple effects in the intricate dance 
of power in the region. In the wake of the attack, the Middle East finds itself at a crossroads, with the next war looming on the horizon. This impending conflict is poised to be a complex, unpredictable affair laden with human and political costs. It's a stark reminder that the illusion of the U.S. disentangling from the region is shattered, with President Joe Biden now grappling with the fallout inherited from the previous administration's policies. Biden's administration, mindful of the burdensome legacy left by its predecessor, sought to chart a new course in the Middle East. Recognizing the need for a strategic realignment, the White House embarked on a mission to recalibrate the balance of power while safeguarding vital American interests. This involved navigating the delicate dance of reducing U.S. presence in the region while averting the risk of a power vacuum exploited by rivals like China. Central to this strategy was fostering closer ties with key allies, including Saudi Arabia and Israel. By forging a united front against common adversaries, notably Iran, the U.S. aimed to assert its influence and mitigate regional instability. However, the road to this new equilibrium was fraught with challenges, as Iran's disruptive role cast a long shadow over diplomatic efforts. The Biden administration's diplomatic overtures towards Iran aimed at diffusing tensions and reigniting dialogue encountered significant hurdles. Despite efforts to incentivize cooperation through economic incentives, Iran remained steadfast in its resistance, buoyed by its strategic alliances and regional ambitions. The recent attack on Israel further underscored Iran's assertiveness, raising questions about its intentions and the broader implications for regional stability. While the exact extent of Iran's involvement in the attack remains unclear, speculations abounds regarding its complicity. Reports suggest clandestine coordination between Iran and proxy groups, fueling concerns about escalating tensions and the risk of broader conflict. This complex geopolitical chess game underscores the enduring volatility of the region, with multiple actors vying for influence amidst shifting alliances and allegiances. Against this backdrop, the Biden administration grappled with a problem. How to effectively address Iran's destabilizing behavior while safeguarding American interests and regional stability? The failure of diplomatic initiatives underscores the need to recalibrate U.S. policy towards Iran, grounded in pragmatism and a clear-eyed assessment of strategic imperatives. Moving forward, the U.S. must adopt a multifaceted approach, leveraging diplomatic, economic, and strategic tools to counter Iran's malign activities. This includes bolstering alliances with regional partners, enhancing deterrence capabilities, and maintaining pressure on Iran through targeted sanctions and diplomatic isolation. So, the aftermath of the attack on Israel serves as a stark reminder of the enduring complexities and challenges facing the Middle East. As the Biden administration grapples with the fallout, the future remains uncertain. However, embracing a comprehensive and nuanced approach, the U.S. can navigate these turbulent waters and advance its strategic objectives in the region. The attack on Israel on October the 7th, 2023, came as a sudden and devastating blow, catching the country's leaders off guard and leaving them scrambling for a response. Scores of fighters from the Gaza Strip breached Israel's borders, unleashing chaos and carnage in their wake. In the months leading up to the assault, Hamas had issued ominous warnings, hinting at its preparations for a confrontation. Back in August, Saleh al aruri the group's second-in-command, has sounded the alarm, cautioning that the Israeli government's policies risked sparking a regional conflagration. In a televised interview with a Lebanese channel, he ominously hinted at the brewing storm, citing Israel's actions in the West Bank and Jerusalem as potential triggers for the conflict. Moreover, he openly declared Hamas's readiness for an all-out war. 
Even earlier, in April, a delegation from Hamas had convened in Lebanon discussing the formation of a joint resistance front against Israel, seeking to forge a robust and coordinated alliance with Hezbollah. This meeting was just one in a series of gatherings involving officials from Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas, underscoring the deepening ties among these militant groups. Reports emerged following the recent rocket barrage on Israel, suggesting that the three factions had coordinated their assault through a joint operations center in Beirut. While Hamas refrained from explicitly announcing a military offensive against Israel, its actions spoke volumes, signaling its intent to strike. Some had hoped that since its takeover of Gaza in 2007, the group might moderate its stance. However, such hopes proved wishful thinking, shattered by the brutal reality of October the 7th. Though the massacre may have been months in the making, its execution bore witness to Hamas's mounting apprehensions over Israel's burgeoning ties with Saudi Arabia and the domestic turmoil plaguing the country. The deteriorating situation in the West Bank underpinned Aruri's ominous warnings of a regional conflict. Incidents of shooting attacks targeting Israelis had surged, prompting intensified counter-terrorism operations in the region. Tensions had also simmered at holy sites like the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Temple Mount, sacred to Islam and Judaism respectively. Right-wing fashions within Israel had been agitating for a change in the status quo at these sites. In April, Israeli forces' incursions into the mosque resulting in the assault of several Palestinians ignited outrage. In response, Hamas rallied Palestinians to defend the Al-Aqsa compound. By September, Israeli authorities had permitted settlers to visit the site, further stoking tensions. The commander of Hamas's military wing framed the subsequent attacks on Israel as a defensive action aimed at safeguarding Al-Aqsa, dubbing the operation Aqsa Flood. Such calls to arms served as potent propaganda, galvanizing support for Hamas's cause. Meanwhile, an unrelated incident in Alexandria, where an Egyptian policeman killed two Israelis, provided an additional pretext for Hamas's belligerence. Foremost among Hamas's motivations for attacking Israel was the latter's intent to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia. Hamas feared that such a move would undercut international support for the Palestinian cause, potentially altering the region's political and religious dynamics. Normalizing ties with Iran, Hamas's chief patron threatened to solidify an anti-Israel alliance comprising Hezbollah and other Iranian proxies. Echoing Aruri's sentiments, Jonathan Feiner asserted Iran's complicity in the October 7 attack, attributing it to Tehran's long-standing support for and training of Hamas militants. The convergence of interests among state sponsors of terrorism posed a grave threat with Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas united in their opposition to any peace overtures. According to the Washington Post, the massacre has been meticulously planned over a year, with the assistance of Iran and its allies, including Hezbollah. This operation laid bare Hamas's true intentions and its unyielding resolve to obliterate Israel. In the weeks preceding the attack, various militant factions including Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas had vehemently opposed efforts to normalize relations with Israel. They decried the prospective establishment of diplomatic ties between Saudi Arabia and Israel, recognizing it as a pivotal juncture that would weaken their position and sideline Palestinian interests. Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, vociferously condemned any such reproachment, labeling it a perilous betrayal of the Palestinian cause. Hamas too issued stern rebukes against the normalization process. Nasrallah and his allies in Tehran and Beirut perceived an opportune moment to capitalize on Israel's internal strife. 
Nasrallah interpreted Israel's political turmoil and security challenges as signs of vulnerability. He posited that the Gaza border, with its reduced Israeli troop presence, presented a tempting target. With reliance on sensors, drones, and surveillance systems rather than boots on the ground, Israel appeared susceptible. Thus, Hamas employed unmanned aerial vehicles to launch attacks, aiming to disrupt Israel's military infrastructure. While the precise involvement of Hezbollah and Iran in orchestrating the attacks remains unclear, Hamas's modus operandi mirrored Hezbollah's playbook of coordinated strikes. Over the years, the Israeli military had honored its readiness for such operations along its northern border. The shock and awe of October 7th stemmed not just from the scale of casualties, but from the audacity and precision of the assault. Conducting a series of attacks across multiple Israeli communities, Hamas's militants penetrated deep into Israeli territory, leaving the nation reeling. Following the assault, Ismail Haniyi, a senior Hamas leader, hailed the group's triumph and rallied Arab nations to join its cause. He criticized defeatists, advocating for normalization with Israel, vowing to persist in the struggle extending beyond the West Bank. The operation's objective, he declared, including freeing Hamas prisoners and reclaiming Al-Aqsa Mosque. Yet the ultimate aim remained. Israel's destruction. By breaching Israel's defenses, Hamas sought to inspire other militant factions to emulate its audacious attacks. It implored Muslim and Arab states, including Saudi Arabia, to abandon any plans for diplomatic ties with Israel. Haniyi asserted Israel's inability to ensure its citizens' safety. While some Arab nations may heed Haniyi's call, the outcome of the conflict is uncertain, as regional powers like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia seek to counter Iran and its proxies, they may recognize the imperative of collective action against militant groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, alongside militias in Iraq and Yemen. The conflict promises to be a sobering lesson for Gulf states on countering Iran's influence. Though the Gaza bloodshed hasn't halted normalization efforts outright, it has thrown a wrench into the machinery, as Israeli officials contend that reverting to the status quo antebellum with Hamas retaining control over Gaza and holding over 150 hostages is untenable. The normalization process remains on hold as Israel confronts Hamas in Gaza, with ordinary Palestinians bearing the brunt of the conflict. The international community may finally reckon with Hamas's terrorist designation in the wake of the Gaza carnage. At least 25 civilians from various countries, including Israel, have perished or gone missing. On October the 10th, the White House disclosed that among the casualties were 14 Americans, with 20 others unaccounted for. Hani'i's statements contradicted the prevalent notion of Hamas's political and military wing's segregation. Aware of Israel's inevitable retaliation, Hamas braced for the onslaught, counting on its urban defenses and labyrinthine tunnels to thwart the enemy. Anticipating support from Iran and Hezbollah, Hamas unleashed rockets and drones while Hezbollah eyed infiltrating Jewish communities. Should Israel escalate to a ground offensive in Gaza, Hezbollah stands ready to open a second front. The specter of regional war looms large, fueling Hamas's aspirations for wider conflagration. Despite speculation that Hamas's administrative duties might temper its militant ambitions, the group prioritized conflict over civilian welfare, forsaking a ceasefire meant to foster economic development. Haniyi dubbed the October 7th confrontation the ultimate jihad, destined to culminate in victory. The attack on Israel on October the 7th came as a shock, shaking up the region and placing Arab governments in a tight spot. 
several Arab nations were either in the process of forging historic agreements with Israel or were on the brink of doing so. Egypt and Jordan, long-standing partners with Israel in peace and diplomacy, also maintain crucial security and diplomatic ties. Despite the challenges Arab governments face, support for the Palestinian cause continues to swell. Therefore, leaders must weigh the consequences for the Gaza conflict carefully to avoid sparking a backlash from the Arab world. Meanwhile, facing mounting struggles, the Palestinian Authority grapples with the escalating situation. The West Bank, already a tinderbox of security concerns, risks being drawn into the fray between Israel and Hamas. This complex scenario has led to stark divisions within the Arab world. Some countries, like the UAE and Bahrain, who have been fostering peace and diplomatic ties with Israel, labeled Hamas as a terrorist organization. Conversely, Qatar, a key Hamas supporter, criticized Israel's actions. Egypt and Jordan, pivotal players in the Arab landscape, tread cautiously, balancing domestic sentiments with national security imperatives. Saudi Arabia, another heavyweight, is in the process of forging a groundbreaking agreement with Israel, notwithstanding the recent attack. The kingdom remains committed to its regional leadership role and support for the Palestinians. Navigating this intricate web places the U.S. in a challenging position. It must balance support for Israel's response to Hamas with a desire to prevent wider conflict and remain relations with Arab allies. The U.S. government has taken various measures to support Israel, including high-level diplomatic engagement and expressions of solidarity. However, the situation in Gaza is fluid with mounting casualties and escalating tensions complicating regional dynamics. Arab governments were caught off guard by Hamas's audacious attack. They had hoped Hamas would not escalate tensions in Gaza as Israel had set conditions for maintaining peace. Yet, Hamas's actions on October the 7th shattered those hopes. Jordan and Egypt, Israel's immediate neighbors, expressed solidarity with the Palestinians while urging an end to violence and criticizing Israel's policies. But both nations grapple with domestic Islamist challenges, adding layers of complexity. The offensive against Gaza has sparked unrest in Egypt and Jordan, with incidents like the killing of Israeli tourists and protests in Amman against Israel. Egypt is wary of large refugee influxes from Gaza. In the Gulf, Qatar supports Hamas, while the UAE and Bahrain condemn its actions, straining relations with Israel. As for Saudi Arabia, its efforts towards an Israel agreement have stalled post-attack, but it remains committed to Palestine and regional stability. With the West Bank situation deteriorating, Arab governments face tough decisions. Palestinian Authority struggles to balance peace efforts with public sentiment amid Israeli provocation and internal dissent. President Abbas's warning credibility, compounded by corruption allegations, fuels the fire. Escalation in the West Bank could upend the region, imperiling the PA, bolstering extremist groups, and derailing peace efforts. The U.S. grapples with this multifaceted regional puzzle, balancing support for allies with conflict containment and humanitarian concerns. Egypt and Jordan play pivotal roles in the Gaza resolution, while Saudi-U.S. relations face complexities. Gulf nations' stance need acknowledgement, Qatar's Hamas support needs addressing, and post-Gaza stability measures warrant consideration. The evolving Gaza situation will shape the U.S.'s regional approach. Washington's goal remains clear, prevent Hamas-like attacks while navigating complex regional dynamics. On October the 7th, 2023, over 1,400 people were killed in one day following a series of attacks by the militant group Hamas. Since then, Israel has carried out a heavy response. According to the Health Ministry of Palestine, over 6,000 people have died in the Gaza Strip due to the Israeli aerial bombardment. Of Israel's decisions to carry out a ground invasion, 
the death toll in Gaza could rise significantly. Some of Israel's political and military leaders have called for a broad military campaign to be carried out in the area. Since the beginning of the operation, about 5% of the buildings in Gaza have been destroyed by Israeli missiles. Some of these were in place where people had sought shelter after heeding the Israeli evacuation orders. Some of Israel's political and military leaders have also declared that all of Gaza's residents are members of Hamas and are targets of the country's retaliation. However, the notion that Gaza's residents bears some responsibility for the actions of Hamas is quickly disproven by examining the facts. An Arab barometer survey conducted in the West Bank and Gaza before the conflict between Israel and Hamas began showed that the majority of people support the establishment of a separate state within Palestine. The results of the survey revealed that most Gazans do not support the militant group Hamas and are fed up with its failure to address the region's economic issues. Most people also don't align with the group's ideology. The majority of the survey respondents believe that Israel should be kept as an independent country with Palestine alongside it. The ongoing violence will not bring the hoped-for outcome for the people of Gaza any closer. Instead of addressing the issues of terrorism, the previous Israeli actions have made it harder for the people of Gaza to live their lives. If the current military operation in Gaza continues to have the same effect on the public's opinion, it will further hinder the effects towards a long-term peace agreement. The Arab Barometer, which is a leading research project in the Middle East, conducted a survey of the public in Gaza and the West Bank before the conflict between Hamas and Israel started. Through its eight waves, the organization has gathered valuable information about the opinions of the public in different countries across the region. The surveys are conducted nationally and are usually carried out in face-to-face -face interviews. The data collected are then publicly available. In each country, the survey aims to measure the values and attitudes of the respondents on various global, political, and economic issues. The survey, which was conducted from September 28th to October the 8th, 2023, was conducted in the West Bank and Gaza. It revealed that the majority of people in both areas have little confidence in the government of the militant group Hamas. When asked about their level of trust in the group's officials, a plurality of the respondents said that they have no confidence in them. Only 29% of the people in Gaza have faith in the government. Also, 72% of the respondents noted that there is a significant amount of corruption in the various government institutions. A minority of the people claimed that the government was taking significant measures to address this issue. The survey also asked the respondents how they would vote in the presidential elections that would be held in Gaza. Only 24% of them would vote for Ismail Haniyeh, the leader of Hamas. The other candidates included President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority and Marwan Barghouti, an imprisoned official of the Fatah party. The survey results revealed that 32% of the respondents in Gaza supported Barghouti, while 12% supported Abbas. The opinion of the people of the West Bank is not much better. Over half of the respondents in Gaza believe that the PA is ineffective and burdensome government, and 67% of them would like to see the president resign. The residents of Gaza are fed up with both Hamas and the leadership of the Palestinians. The survey results revealed that the economic situation in Gaza has worsened over the past couple of years. According to the World Bank's report, the number of people living in poverty in the area has increased from 39% to 59% in 2021. Many of the people in the region have struggled to meet their basic needs due to the lack of food. About 75% of the respondents said they were struggling to afford food even though it was available. Only 6% of the respondents claimed that food affordability was not an issue. The lack of food has affected the households in Gaza. 
According to the survey, over 70% of the respondents said they ran out of food within the past 30 days. This alarming figure is a significant increase from the previous year. In 2021, only 51% of the respondents said they had this problem. The situation has forced the people of Gaza to alter their habits to try to make ends meet. Some of the challenges that they have made include buying cheaper food and smaller meals. Most of the people in Gaza blame their current food shortages on internal issues rather than external sanctions. Since 2005, Egypt and Israel have been restricting the movement of people and goods into or out of the territory through a blockade. The strength of this blockade has varied, but it became more extreme after Hamas took over Gaza in 2007. Despite the various factors that have affected the food situation in Gaza, the survey revealed that the government's mismanagement is the leading cause of the issue. In addition, 26% of the respondents blame inflation for the situation. The other 16% blamed external sanctions. The people of Gaza are more likely to blame Hamas's leadership for their economic problems than Israel's blockade. The perception of this issue may have changed since the survey was conducted. Following the attacks on October 7th, Israel cut off various supplies to Gaza, which severely affected the region's humanitarian situation. Although some aid has started to enter the area, the suffering experienced by the Palestinians may have made their attitudes towards Israel more hostile. The survey results indicate that the people of Gaza want political change. In 2021, only 26% of the respondents said that the government was responsive to their needs. This figure has dropped 8 points since then. When asked what the most effective way for the people of Gaza to influence their government is, a plurality of respondents said that nothing is effective. The other popular answer was to use their personal connections to get in touch with officials. Most Gazans have no choice but to remain silent when it comes to expressing their grievances against the ruling Hamas government. Only 40% of the respondents think freedom of expression is generally granted in the territory, while 68% claim it is strictly limited under Hamas rule. The results of the survey indicate that the people of Gaza support democracy. Over half of the respondents stated that it is always better to have a democracy than a non-democratic government. A small percentage of the respondents indicated that they do not trust any type of government. In a similar survey conducted in the US in 2022, a majority of the respondents agreed that dictatorship could be beneficial in certain circumstances. It is no surprise that the people in Gaza don't like the government of Hamas. Only 27% of the respondents considered the group as their preferred political party, which is less than the number of who prefer the rival party, the one led by Abbas, the West Bank's ruling authority. The number of people supporting the government of Hamas has decreased significantly since the previous survey in 2021. Support for the group among younger respondents has increased, while support for older individuals had dropped. Gazans with a lower socioeconomic status were likely to support the organization. Only 25% of the respondents could not afford to pay their basic expenses, and 33% favored the ruling party. The results of this survey indicate that the support for Hamas has decreased significantly among the people of Gaza. The individuals who experienced the most economic hardships and those who remember their life before the group took over Gaza showed a higher inclination to reject the organization. Besides their disdain for the leadership style of Hamas, the survey also revealed that the people of Gaza don't share the group's goal of eliminating Israel. When presented with three different possible solutions to the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, most of the respondents said that they would support a two-state solution. The Palestinians would be able to establish a state of Palestine within the boundaries of Israel that were before the Six-Day War in 1967. 
the number of people supporting this resolution has remained the same since 2021. In 2021, 58% of the respondents in Gaza supported the two-state plan. The surprising part of the survey results is how little support there is for alternative arrangements, given how implausible the two-state solution is at present. The survey suggested that the Palestinians in Israel form a confederation and establish a single state for the Arabs and Jews. The survey results show that the people of Gaza support a peaceful resolution to the conflict between Israel and Palestine. On the day of the attack by Hamas on October the 7th, only 20% of the respondents said that a military solution was the best option to resolve the issue. A clear majority of the people who responded said that they were supporters of Hamas. A little over 13% didn't identify with any political party. The opinions of the people of Gaza on the normalization of ties between Israel and Arab states have remained negative. In the most recent survey, only 10% of the respondents expressed support for this idea, which is unchanged from the previous survey in 2021. Many in the territory believe that an independent Palestine can only be achieved through the support of other Arab nations. Any hopes of a two-state resolution are likely to disappear if Arab countries do not make a commitment to resolve the conflict between the Palestinians and Israel before normalization can take place. Before the attack on Israel, the foreign policy views of the people in Gaza suggested that they were closely aligned with the US's priorities and suspicions about the country. Over 70% of the respondents opposed Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and only 26% expressed a desire for the region to develop stronger ties with the US. This figure is lower than the 32% who want to strengthen relations with Russia or Iran. Only 15% of the respondents claim that US President Joe Biden's policies have benefited the Arab world, and their approval ratings have dropped significantly over the past several weeks. This is because the people of Gaza as well as the West Bank and other Arab nations have accused Washington of supporting Israel at the price of Gaza. The overwhelming majority of the people of Gaza are committed to staying in the territory. According to the survey results, 69% of the respondents say they have no plans to leave their homes. This figure is higher than that of residents of other countries such as Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq. The data collected from these countries came from the Arab Barometer's most recent survey, which was conducted from 2021 to 2022. Despite the various challenges that Gazans face, they have still committed to staying in the region. The survey revealed a pessimistic outlook for Gaza before the attacks on October 7th. Most of the people in the territory believed that the government of Hamas was incapable of addressing their concerns, and few others supported the group's goal of destroying Israel. This left the region's leaders and residents divided. Most of the people of Gaza support a two-state solution to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine, and they desire leaders who can deliver on their promise of improving the living conditions in the area. Unfortunately, the policies of the Israeli government and the ruling Hamas organization have prevented progress on these goals. Although the living condition in the West Bank are better than those in Gaza, the political and economic situation remains grim. Half of the survey respondents in the region said that they recently went hungry and only 19% of them trusted the government of the West Bank led by the Fatah party. Despite the various governance failures in the West Bank, the Palestinians have not supported the movement known as Hamas. Only 17% of the residents of the region support the group, as opposed to 30% in Gaza. The level of support for the rival movement Fatah was also the same as in Gaza. However, the survey results indicated that the residents of the West Bank were not happy with the performance of their local leaders. The survey respondents had their own choice for the next president. When asked who they would like to see as the next leader of the Palestinians, 35% said they would like to see Barghouti, while Hani was second choice with 11% and 6% respectively.
The number of people in the West Bank who support a two-state solution to the conflict with Israel was slightly lower than those in Gaza. However, the majority of the people in the region still opposed the normalization of relations between Israel and Arab states. The results of the survey revealed that the attitudes of the people in the West Bank were more hardened due to the recent tensions between Israeli soldiers and settlers. Although the survey showed that around half of the Palestinians still supported a two-state solution, this figure did not inspire confidence in the region's short-term stability. The widespread unpopularity of the leadership of the Palestinians in the West Bank as well as in Gaza raises questions about the possibility of the PA regaining control over the territory following the IDF's military operation against Hamas. As the situation in Gaza worsens, the war will undoubtedly take a heavy toll on civilians. Even if Israel were to achieve its objectives of leveling Gaza, it would not be able to eliminate the militant group Hamas. According to the research, the frequent Israeli attacks on Gaza have resulted in an increased support for the group. In 2006, the Palestinians voted for the Islamist movement Hamas, which won 44.5% of the votes. However, its support dropped after a violent confrontation between the group and Fatah in 2007, which led to Hamas' takeover of Gaza. In 2007, only 24% of the people in Gaza expressed favorable views of the group. In response to the Israeli blockade of Gaza, the number of people supporting the group increased. In 2010, about 40% of the people in the territory supported Hamas. However, its support started to decrease in 2014. During times of military action against the group, its hardline ideology appeals to the people of Gaza. Instead of moving the Palestinians and Israelis towards a peace agreement, Israel's policies that target Gaza will only lead to more violence. The Israeli government should exercise restraint to stop the cycle of violence. Although the government of Hamas is not interested in peace, it is wrong for politicians in Israel to make the same claims about the people of Gaza. Most of the people of Gaza support a two-state resolution to the conflict with Israel, and they are open to a peaceful solution. However, their views are often misrepresented in the public. Israeli and U.S. leaders must work together to ensure the safety of the civilians in Gaza. The U.S. and the U.N. should establish safe zones and humanitarian corridors. The American government should also contribute to the UN's appeal for additional aid to protect the Palestinians. Senators from the US have already said they will support this request. The US and Israel should also realize that the Palestinians are partners in finding a lasting peace agreement. If they only pursue military solutions, they will drive the Palestinians into the hands of Hamas, which would lead to more violence in the future. Since the historic vote by the United Nations General Assembly in 1947, which endorsed the partitioning of Palestine into Arab and Jewish states, the organization has found itself entangled in a multitude of crises across the Middle East. Over the ensuing decades, the discourse surrounding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has followed a recurring pattern often characterized by the United States leveraging its veto power in the Security Council to block resolutions critical of Israel. The recent deliberations at the United Nations, spurred by the October 7th onslaught by Hamas on Israel, echo this established trajectory. Despite the U.S. successfully thwarting Security Council discussions on a ceasefire, its influence proved ineffectual in preventing the General Assembly from passing a resolution urging a humanitarian truce. Nonetheless, diplomats stationed in Geneva and New York were quick to observe a distinct tenor in the current crisis. They cautioned that its reverberations may extend far beyond the region potentially reaching the very heart of the UN's headquarters. The mounting casualties in Gaza, the looming specter of regional escalation, and the unabated ferocity of Hamas collectively contribute to an atmosphere of heightened urgency and gravity. Even amidst a panorama of myriad crises, the members of the UN retain a palpable sense of apprehension regarding the organization's future trajectory. The UN's 
seeming incapability to effectively address the myriad global challenges has precipitated a pervasive erosion of confidence in its efficacy. Over the past year alone, the UN faltered in mounting robust responses to conflicts in Sudan and Nagorno-Karabakh. According to discerning voices within the Security Council, the burgeoning tensions between Western powers and Russia over Ukraine only exacerbated the complexities of addressing other pressing global concerns, including those in the Middle East and Africa. In a dire warning issued last September, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres cautioned that the world's governance apparatus teetered perilously on the brink of collapse. The ongoing quarrel between Israel and Hamas threatens to deliver a staggering blow to the UN's credibility as a preeminent global peacekeeper. This impels UN officials and member states onto an inevitable collision course, compelling a recalibration of strategies for addressing security and peace imperatives amidst a rapidly dwindling common ground among major world powers. For years, myriad civil society groups and nation-states have clamored for the UN to adopt a provocative stance in confronting conflicts, both minor and momentous. However, the organization's circumscribed geographic purview has often impeded its efficacy in this regard. To facilitate these challenges, the UN must reassert its focus on its core mission while judiciously delegating certain crisis management functions to other capable entities. Nonetheless, certain international quandaries necessitate the specialized coordination and oversight that only the UN can furnish. Despite its evident shortcomings, the UN endures as a pivotal forum where an adversaries can engage in constructive dialogue to forge common ground. UN officials and member states must collaborate as judiciously to safeguard the organization's core functions from being imperiled by contemporary conflicts. Russia's incursion into Ukraine has exacerbated the erosion of trust in the UN, initially feared to imperil the organization's operations. The diplomatic standoff between major powers proved less cataclysmic than anticipated. Despite vehement discord over Ukraine, US, Russian, and European cooperation persisted on key fronts. In response to the crisis in Haiti, the Security Council imposed sanctions on criminal factions while extending aid to Afghanistan through a revamped mandate. Nevertheless, Russia's recalentrance within the UN, epitomized by its vetoes on resolutions concerning Syria and Gaza, has soured relations within the Security Council. Russia's castigation of the US for vetoing a resolution pertaining to humanitarian aid to Gaza has only severed to exacerbate tensions. This diplomatic posturing not only ruffled the feathers of, of Security Council members, but also elicited disquiet among Arab states regarding Russia's ulterior motives. Should Russia persist in obstructing UN efforts, the diplomatic repercussions could imperil US support for Israel. The recent General Assembly resolution advocating a ceasefire laid bare the deepening schisms among member states, particularly via the issues such as Ukraine. This setback for the U.S. portends potential ramifications for its diplomatic endeavors within the U.N., including proposed reforms to the Security Council and initiatives aimed at bolstering developing nations. The confluence of conflicts in the Middle East and Ukraine has strained the U.N.'s report with its member states while imposing a Herculean burden on Secretary General Guterres and the organization's conflict management machinery. Despite sustaining a humanitarian presence in conflict zones like Afghanistan, the UN struggles to secure adequate funding amid retrenchments in Western aid allocations. Secretary General Guterres found himself ensnared in a diplomatic maelstrom following his remarks on the Israel-Hamas conflagration. While his pronouncements garnered support from certain member states, they elicited a rebuke from Israel underscoring the UN's vulnerability in aid operations. The duration and intensity of the Israel-Hamas war could reverberate across the UN's operations in the region. In an optimistic scenario though, 
the UN could play a pivotal role in facilitating Gaza's post-conflict recovery. However, protracted hostilities might jeopardize peacekeeping endeavors in Lebanon and in the Golan Heights. Irrespective of the consequences in Ukraine and the Middle East, the UN is poised to confront various enduring challenges. The organization must recalibrate its security and diplomatic modalities to navigate the evolving global landscape and retain its relevance. The Middle East, a region with a history of tensions and complex political situations, has again been thrown into the chaos after the bold attack by Hamas on Israel on October the 7th. This single incident has had far-reaching effects, significantly changing the power dynamics in the area. The impact of this conflict goes beyond the region, influencing global politics and the delicate balance of power. With a loss of life and more trapped in the violence, Israel's military actions on Gaza poses one of the biggest challenges to the U.S. regional strategies since the events of 2011. The continuous attacks on Gaza have resulted in a number of casualties, with reports suggesting over 12,000 Palestinian injuries. The consequences of these conflicts have spread throughout the Middle East, sparking American sentiments and encouraging Iranian-backed groups to increase their attacks on U.S. forces in nearby Syria and Iraq. In response to these escalating tensions, the United States quickly moved its resources into action by sending thousands of troops and aircraft carriers to reinforce its regional presence. Defensive systems were also sent to allies like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait as a signal to Iran that Washington would not tolerate any further escalation and hostilities involving Israel. However, while this show of strength was aimed at deterring proxies from targeting Israel, it also had the potential to unintentionally escalate conflicts and spark a crisis. The increase in U.S. presence in the Middle East poses a challenge for policymakers in Washington. While the goal may be to demonstrate power and protect interests, the truth is that such actions could unintentionally worsen existing tensions and expose the U.S. to dangers. Additionally, the strain of prolonged involvement in the region risks diverting resources and attention from other important global priorities like addressing China's assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific. Despite the pressing nature of the situation, the Biden administration has not indicated a shift in Middle East policy. The U.S. continues to follow an approach careful not to overextend its forces and worsen instability. Maintaining the situation is unsustainable, and decisive steps are required to pave a sustainable path. As events continue to unfold in Gaza, it is crucial for the United States to reassess its strategy towards the region and adopt a nuanced approach. This involves reducing troop levels and re-evaluating commitments, allowing regional partners to assume greater responsibility for their own security. Diplomatic efforts must be intensified to calm tensions and encourage dialogue among all parties involved. The U.S. should use its influence to promote interactions and pave the way for resolving the conflict in the Middle East. It's crucial to reevaluate strategies and move away from intervention approaches. By taking a practical stance, the U.S. can protect its interests without getting too involved or escalating the situation. While challenges lie ahead, strategic planning and diplomatic flexibility can help the U.S. navigate through these times in the Middle East towards a sustainable and secure future. Since October 7th, casualties soared, surpassing a grim milestone of over a thousand lives lost and more than 200 individuals abducted. As the chaos unfolded, a new battleground emerged in the digital realm fueled by the rapid dissemination of graphic and incendiary content across social media platforms. Israel swiftly retaliated with its own military offensive against Hamas, escalating the conflict to unprecedented levels. Within a month, the death toll surged to over 10,000, 
marking a harrowing chapter in the region's history. Amidst the onslaught, Gaza found itself besieged by Israeli forces, blurring the lines between physical and virtual warfare. Platforms like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Telegram, and Facebook became arenas where opposing narratives clashed, each vying for legitimacy and support. In this age of ubiquitous smartphones and instant communication, the impact of these developments reverberated globally, shaping public perceptions and influencing policy decisions. In their 2018 work titled Like War, the Weaponization of Social Media by P. W. Singer and Emerson T. Brooking underscored the profound influence of social media in modern conflicts, transcending traditional notions of warfare. Across the globe, nations have acknowledged the significance of information space, with Iran and China actively developing strategies to wield influence in the digital arena. Amidst the chaos, patterns of information warfare emerged, characterized by the deliberate dissemination of disinformation and attempts to manipulate public sentiments. During the conflict, the proliferation of misleading information reached unprecedented levels, inundating social media feeds with falsifying images and narratives. Both sides, driven by their respective agendas, exploited emotive content to sway public opinion and justify their actions. The narrative war escalated as Israel and Hamas vied for international support, leveraging digital platforms to disseminate propaganda and discredit their adversaries. Despite technological advancements, states grappled with the challenge of countering non-state actors in the information space, resorting to measures such as internet blackouts and legal campaigns to control the narrative. Israel's strategic adaptation, characterized by targeted attacks on Gaza's communication infrastructure and diplomatic efforts to censor online content, underscored the evolving nature of modern warfare. The conflict laid bare the power of information in shaping perceptions and influencing outcomes, heralding a new era where virality can eclipse factual accuracy. Looking ahead, the lessons learned from this conflict underscore the growing significance of information warfare in future conflicts. As nations prepare for the digital battleground, studies on cognitive warfare and strategies for manipulating global audiences foreshadow a future where wars are fought and won in the realm of information. In this digital age, where lies and likes to wield unprecedented power, the battlefield extends beyond physical borders, shaping the course of conflicts on every continent. It is no wonder that people across this earth have been deeply moved by the profound suffering endured by the Palestinian people amidst the ongoing conflict with Israel. The loss of innocent lives, the destruction of homes and infrastructure, and the psychological trauma inflicted upon generations are all stark reminders of the inhumanity that pervades this protracted struggle. The weaponization of information, the spread of disinformation, and the manipulation of public sentiment only serve to exacerbate the pain and perpetuate the cycle of violence. In proposing a resolution, it is imperative to prioritize the principles of justice, dignity, and human rights for all parties involved. A sustainable solution must encompass the establishment of a viable Palestinian state alongside Israel with clear borders, sovereignty, and the right to self-determination. This necessitates an end to illegal settlements, the lifting of blockades, and restrictions on movements, and the recognition of Palestinian rights to land, water, and resources. Moreover, genuine efforts towards reconciliation, dialogue, and mutual understanding are indispensable for fostering a lasting peace that upholds the dignity and aspirations of both Palestinians and Israelis alike. Only through concerted diplomatic efforts, guided by empathy, compassion, and a commitment to shared humanity, can we hope to transcend the divisions and forge a path toward a brighter, more peaceful future in the region.